Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Supporting Students with Disabilities uh, in Virtual Environments School Reentry. My name is Angela Kirby, and I'm the director of the Patent Harrisburg office. And on behalf of the whole patent system, we'd like to welcome you to this day of learning. Students with disabilities are particularly vulnerable during this time of disruption and change as a result of the pandemic. But we are all here as educators because we're worried about our students, especially our most vulnerable students with complex needs who may struggle in these virtual environments. Our students are dependent upon us and our collective will as a community to do whatever it takes to meet their needs. In order to equitably serve our learners and families and ensure, to ensure ongoing growth and progress, we will focus our planning efforts as a patent system on how to support Pennsylvania educators serving students with disabilities as much as possible in order to provide practical tailored supports around remote learning that will ensure or provide uh, educational benefit to our students. We know our students need structure and consistency. Uh, we know that they benefit from our um, passion and commitment uh, and motivation to support them, to build relationships with us as adults, their families and their peers. It is a credit to you. It is a credit to you as educators um, that you took this day out of your summer to try to prepare for what we know is a very, very difficult situation we're all facing. But you need to know that we are here all together and we are here to uh, ensure that our work meets your needs. Our job at Patna is to provide support to educators serving students with disabilities. We hope to, through the initiative Supporting Students with Disabilities in Virtual Environments initiative, which was just newly established by the Bureau of Special Education this past spring, we hope to establish professional learning communities throughout the school year with experts in virtual learning, assessment, related services, IEP process, universal design for learning, as well as training and commonly used tech tools. But we need your input. So throughout the course of today, we will be asking for your input. Um, just as we uh, solicited input with regards to this training, where we looked and had about 1,500 people provide us with feedback as to what they're looking for, we will constantly try to iterate and make changes to our supports to the field based on your feedback. There will be specific questions in the uh, conclusion of today's session for you to give us that feedback and tell us how we can support you this year. One of the quotes that we say a lot at Patton is a quote by Teddy Roosevelt, and it says, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is a chance to work hard at work worth doing. And I would add that what makes this work worth doing is the supports that we provide to our families and our students through some very, very difficult and challenging times. We are about work worth doing, and I hope and know that we will support each other as we plan for this 2020-21 school year. Just a couple of quick logistical notes. The keynote this morning, the keynotes this morning, um, are being streamed through our YouTube channel, and the closing keynote will also be streamed through our YouTube channel, and that will be the Bureau Director Special Ed. But all concurrent sessions will be via Zoom. Once a Zoom room is filled, you will be put in a waiting list, so maybe you're going to consider try attending another session at that time. I want to give a special shout out to Sarah Frey, Ethan Pan, Sergio Anaya, and all the patent consultants who tailored sessions based on the survey results up until yesterday. Uh, so we were still trying to figure out how to get sessions, sessions, concurrent sessions to meet the needs of our registrants up until yesterday. So just a special shout out to everybody who repurposed uh, trainings that they did in the past, modified them, uh, and did whatever it takes um, to make sure that this is meaningful for the folks participating. So now it's my great honor to um, introduce uh, our two keynotes who are kind of doing this jointly. Um, and first um, I'll introduce is Dr. David Bateman, who is a professor at Chippensburg University in the Department of Educational Leadership and Special Education, where he teaches in courses in special ed, assessment, and facilitating inclusion. He is a former due process hearing officer for Pennsylvania and for over eight, 580 hearings. Um, and he uses his knowledge of litigation relating to special education to assist school districts in providing appropriate supports for students with disabilities. 
His areas of research have been the role of principals in special education, and he has been a classroom teacher of students with learning disabilities, behavior disorders, intellectual disabilities, hearing impairments, a building administrator, and a building administrator. He has earned a PhD in special education from the University of Kansas, and he has recently co-authored books, A Principal's Guide to Special Ed, A Teacher's Guide to Special Ed, Charting the Course Special Ed in Charter Schools, and, for, um, and Current Trends and Legal Issues in Special Ed. So we're very excited to have Dr. Bateman as one of our co-keynote speakers. Uh, our second keynote speaker today is also um, has an allegiance to the University of Kansas also, and it's Dr. Sean Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith is a professor in the Department of Special Ed at the University of Kansas. He is also past president of um, Technology Division for CEC. He is uh, supports um, ISTE. He's a member of the National Down Syndrome Congress, and his research interest focuses on innovations and technology solutions to support struggling learners with those with disabilities, particularly interventions aligned to universal design for learning framework. He has led many federally funded projects exploring the impact of online and distance learning for all learners, the role of virtual reality on struggling learners in the area of social emotional development and technology innovations specific to literacy. So please join me in welcoming both Dr. Bateman and Dr. Smith. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I, got, I, I grabbed the short straw, so I'm up first. Uh, and as Angela mentioned, my name is Sean Smith. I'm gonna get started with the presentation here. And unless I hear from my colleagues that folks cannot see the screen, I'm gonna assume that the technology is working well. So I wanna introduce myself a little bit further to give you a little context. So as Angela mentioned, I'm a faculty member here at uh, the University of Kansas uh, in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, but I'm also, and, and so of course I can talk to special education, and as Angela mentioned, I've done a lot of work in technology. Right now we're working in the area of virtual reality and social emotional skills. And I wish I had a tool to give you. We're, we're still developing that as we speak because the whole idea is to allow it to be fairly independent. But also I've worked in the area of online learning. I've taught in online learning, oh gosh, since 1999. But I've worked in K-12 focus uh, with the Center on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. It's a national center that was funded by the US Department of Education. It's a research center, and I will provide a link to that later on, but it's more research orientated. But I wanna mention that because what I'm gonna sp speak to you about today and to kind of get us started is based on some of that research uh, with families, with educators, uh, with school districts across the country over the last six to seven years. Uh, there's a lot that has taken place in hybrid, blended, as well as fully online learning prior to the pandemic. And I wanna kind of reinforce some of that as we go along. Now I did not set my timer, so there you go. So I'm not getting into David's time as we get started. So to get started uh, though, I wanna make sure uh, everyone has this URL. Now I'll, I'll pause here for just a second to kind of give you a sense of what I'm gonna to try to do this morning to get us set up. But I'd ask you, if you'd like, to simply type in that address. No need to type in the www. And for the colleagues that are engaged with this that potentially are sending information out to everybody, they might be doing this as well. The big thing here with a bit.ly, for those that have used it, is you need to be case sensitive. So capital C, capital D, and capital S is necessary. This will take you to the presentation for this morning. And I also have hyperlinked for presentations I'll be facilitating throughout the day. Now I see my role this morning is to kind of set us, get us a bit established with this idea of, are we gonna be in the hybrid? Are we gonna be in the blended? Are we gonna be fully online? Are we gonna be going back and forth? Uh, where does the face-to-face -face fall in? And I'll try to make those connections this morning. And so my agenda this morning really is to have us thinking about some of these models that we know can work for individuals with disabilities particularly, what some of those things engage, what they require, how we can take good practice with digital tools and kind of combine them, something that we've all been thinking about since mid-March, and a little bit in between. So that's my focus this morning. Hopefully that's given you enough time to take a screen capture or whatever of that URL and feel free to, to join me along on this presentation. So with that said, as I mentioned a moment ago, our agenda for today. And so 
If you have joined me on this presentation, I want to mention two additional resources. Schoolvirtually.org is a resource uh, that uh, some colleagues and I created back during the pandemic, and we're adding to it as we go along. It's basically for educators and for family members. It's not everything, but it's trying to get folks thinking about planning and designing for blended, hybrid, fully online, particularly in mind for students with disabilities, but also how we can further empower family members that are so critical in this hybrid, blended, fully online experience. So that Google folder, that's school virtually, the Google folder will take you to the presentations I'm facilitating today, as well as to a couple of resources I've created that go beyond simply the presentations with, yes, more digital tools. That's what we all need, more digital tools. Well, my goal today is to make connections between some of these tools and some of the solutions. All right, so with that said, we're gonna move forward. And the first thing I wanna reinforce, now I know many of us are in lots of different places. Some of us, school's starting very, very soon. Others of us, we have a few more weeks. Um, others of us, it may be shifting as we speak. I've been fortunate to spend some of the summer in the Kansas City out with schools, both uh, Catholic schools and public schools. And it's interesting, in May I'm meeting with some that now I'm going back to because things have shifted. Uh, I'm surrounded by districts, some will be with us after Labor Day, others are starting today, some are going fully online, some are hybrid, some are face-to-face, -face. it really varies. What I wanna emphasize, and make sure we're all on the same page, as, as we're planning, and some of you may have a little bit more time to plan than others, and I'd argue we're gonna be planning for the next several months. But as we start planning, I wanna reinforce that we are not back in March, April, May, when we go forward in August, September, and October. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, folks, you may say, well, Sean, I'm gonna be fully online, just like I was in April, but it's not the same. We are not going face-to-face -face one day and fully online the next. And you may say, well, wait, Sean, the University of North Carolina, they just did that. Well, I hope they were doing some planning because that's the, that, that's the, the twist today, is we are gonna be planning for that flexibility. We went from face-to-face, -face, everything's going along, all of a sudden we're socially isolated. That is not happening this fall at that level. We have time to plan, and many of us have been planning since May, June, July, August. This has been one of those summers as educators, and we've all had them, where, what summer? What vacation? Yeah, that long weekend, that was very enjoyable. I've certainly had those, and I'm having it this summer, where we've been planning for, maybe it's that new reading initiative, or the anti-bullying program, or something else, or it's, a, it's our first couple of years of teaching and the summers are spent time preparing and planning. That's the type of summer we've had. Now, back in the pandemic, or I know we're still in the pandemic, but back in the spring, what were these technology, what's Flipgrid? What were these technologies? Zoom, I thought that was a PBS show. All of a sudden now, we are at a level that we know a number of these technologies. I imagine several of you have your go-to technologies. Others of you are exploring newer technologies. We're not gonna be self-isolating. Self, uh, self We're not in the consideration, do I go to the grocery store and wash my groceries when we come back into the house? Things are gonna be different this fall. I only wanna emphasize that because the educators I've been interacting with over the last several months, many of them, when they think online learning, they think April and May. And it is gonna be different in so many different ways. And so with that said, let's go forward rather than looking back and let's think about this reopening. Again, knowing that many of us are at different levels. So when I think of reopening, I think of news, everything from what's happening in our backyard. And we just heard a, a new announcement uh, of, in terms of what Lawrence is gonna do. Uh, and we're in our county, our county just came out. Of course, the large districts throughout the country are going fully online. Uh, I'm interacting with the Archdiocese of Arlington, just south of many of you there in Pennsylvania, and they're going face-to-face. -face. They're surrounded by schools. They're going fully online. So it's really different, right? Things are shifting. Things are changing. Now, we know when we do any of our face-to-face, -face, 
there'll be social distancing, there'll be a cleaning process, we'll be taking temperatures, there's all these different operational things, families are making choices, they have deadlines or the deadlines have already been, I know ours was. And I don't know about you folks, but this has been an interesting summer just in the idea that when people talk to me about square footage, I would think, uh, yeah, I think I know the square footage of my kitchen because we're trying to redo the floor. Square footage of my classroom, uh, no, but I imagine a number, of us now, a, a number of us now are like, oh yeah, I totally know the square footage and this is how many students can be in my classroom at a safe uh, basis. I was just in my classroom uh, yesterday and it looks very different than it looked, uh, they finally let me in, looks very different than what it looked like uh, several months ago. Uh, very open. I didn't know it had as much space as it has. I still don't know my square footage. But anyways, we know there's lots of different things going on. And there's things that we're learning along the way. So lots of questions. And this uh, day, we'll begin to answer some of those questions, or at least get us thinking about where we can potentially go for some of those answers to the questions we're asking. What I want to do is I want to focus in on this curriculum and instruction, okay? And so there's lots of different things we can look at in terms of uh, the basic operationalized, the culture, things of that nature, but I wanna focus in on the curriculum instruction. And when we focus in on curriculum instruction, something I wanna emphasize is the silver lining for individuals with disabilities. And I, I would argue for all individuals, but I'm gonna focus on individuals with disabilities. Oh, folks, and I should have this up here, and just to contextualize, I should have offered this as well, I can speak to it from the scholarship perspective, as I, as I will, and, and make some connections, but I also can speak to it from a parent perspective. See, my son, who's 19, he just finished Project Search, has Down syndrome, and I have four children. Uh, Nolan has Down syndrome. Nolan was fully included um, to a degree, and when I say to a degree, he, he went out and had some resource assistance throughout his K-12 experience. But the reason I'm mentioning Nolan is Nolan lived with technology. He utilized a number of the tools that many of us are exploring and using today. Now, yes, he was face-to-face, -face, but without those digital technology supports, without the level of supports through frameworks like Universal Design for Learning that I'm emphasizing in just a moment, his success and inclusion wouldn't have been there. So I see that the silver linings we're talking about in hybrid, blended, or fully online, I've lived it as a parent of a child with Down syndrome, and he has Down syndrome. He has an intellectual disability. And yet, he finished, he was homecoming king, he was fully included to certain levels. Uh, uh, some of the teachers would say he's the mayor of town, everyone knows him. We have many students like that. But see, online digital or, per, or, or fully, uh, fully online, uh, hybrid, personalized, whatever you wanna call it, can personalize the learning experience. The digital tools are a great way to differentiate and plan for the variability of a lot of our learners. And I know many of us use digital tools prior to the pandemic. Text-to-speech was a go-to, right? So was word prediction and a list of other technologies. Now, of course, we also saw the fact that you could plan for variability, allowing for this tool to be used for this student, this tool to be used for that student, et cetera. And of course, by planning, designing, that silver lining means that we can plan design for all. And this is where I think our general education colleagues will be able to see, wow, I'm planning for these students, and in the process, I plan for these struggling learners, these students with disabilities, et cetera. I'll reinforce that in just a moment. And lastly, silver lining, and actually this is just the beginning of a long list, so many of our digital tools can provide embedded supports. Well, I'm using Google Classroom. Well, great, Google Classroom has so many embedded supports for formative feedback for our students. We'll talk about that in another session. To speech to text, to text to speech, to word prediction, and so many other things sitting there in Google Classroom for our use. And of course, it doesn't have to be Google Classroom. It could be other learning management systems. But let's get started, let's get started. So the first thing I wanna do, number one, number one, is I wanna connect in a very purposeful way, this idea that in the hybrid blended fully online experience, we can very much take what we know works, 
what we know is effective, or dare I say, what we know is evidence-based in terms of our practices, and we can tie them nicely with digital tools. And I think this is a critical component for our planning. And what I mean here is that we have the list of digital tools, all right? And then, of course, we have these practices that we do face-to-face and we know quite well. Well, I think one of the things we should be doing in our planning is a connection of both. And this is how we're going to be very successful in the hybrid blended fully online experience. And I know many of you are already there. I want to reinforce it. So let's take an easy topic. Well, I'm not sure if it's an easy topic. It's a critical topic. I'm going to take it in two different areas and kind of make a reinforcement for us. And I'm going to tie that to an evidence-based practice and actually technology, which actually is a bit combined to begin with. So let me start. Many of us that are going into a hybrid model or blended learning model are going to have a face-to-face component, right? Now, some of us are like, well, Sean, that's not going to happen for the near future. We're, we're going fully online. Okay. Well, with the virus still with us, many of us, when we go face-to-face, are going to have to worry about hand cleaning, social distancing. We're going to worry about where the masking tape is on the floor. What color are we using? What does blue mean? What does red mean? The list goes on on these things that we're gonna to need to cover. How to wear the mask, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's st- stop there for just a second. I'll come back to that. But those are all skills that are critical. We're gonna to need to explicitly teach them. We're gonna to need to make certain that they actually are doing those things because hey, school can't be successful without them. And by the way, they're gonna take time. And actually when we're using them, they're gonna take time. Uh, time away from our instruction, time away from what we can do face-to-face, particularly if we're in a hybrid setting where Monday, Tuesday, we get some students, Wednesday, Thursday, we get the rest of our students, and Friday is our planning day or whatever our schedule is looking like, it's going to be critical for us to maximize our time. And this is one that's going to eat into our time. Now, learning-wise, executive function skills, let's just start there and stop there. I know all of us are like, of course, executive function skills, yes, major challenge for the students we serve. Maybe some of us have been interacting with our general education colleagues over the the pandemic, and they've been saying, I really didn't appreciate executive function skills. Uh, I think I need to start teaching explicitly executive function skills. Yay, silver lining. But what I'm talking about there is when our students are fully online, yeah, that ability to prioritize, that ability to stay on task, that ability to attend, the list of things that we're required to have internal to us that our students by the definition of disability, don't have are critical. So we're going to need to facilitate that. We're going to need to model that. We're going to need to to explicitly teach and create and facilitate. We're going to need to create some things that allow for that attention that we can't control because they're at home and, and we're at school. You know, we can only say, turn on that camera so many times or get in your seat. Where are you? I'm, I'm kidding, but anyways, executive function skills. Okay, so think of these, the social distancing and think of the, the whole pan- pragmatics of the health aspect for um, the uh, COVID. And then I think, of course, from an academic perspective across all our learners, across all our grades, there's going to be a level of attention, prioritizing, task completion. And by the way, if you're with me um, online, excuse me, uh, on the, uh, the uh, presentation, there's a couple of links for more on executive functions which I know many of us already know, but anyways, they're just in case. Now we need to explicitly teach them. Oh, and by the way, this is another resource. If you're like, Sean, I, I, don't, I don't understand how these issues in reading or organization or writing are gonna have an impact on my students. Uh, understood.org has a phenomenal resource. It will reinforce why it's critical to, to, to make those connections with some of our students. These are uh, links, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of going sideways for a moment. These four are links uh, to get it, it kind of a, that perspective uh, through the child's eyes, so to speak. And understood.org has created some wonderful experiences. Uh, one, on attention and organization, number three, and number four, to feel like you're having limited in executive function skills. The reading and writing, that's more to feel like you're having struggles in reading and writing. Okay, so why am I rambling on this? Well, think about the fact that I'm going to have to cover all this issue in terms of hand cleaning and making sure they have all this information, et cetera, et cetera. Think about the skills I need to develop in executive functions while I'm teaching reading, while I'm teaching writing, while I'm teaching science and things of that nature. I don't have a class on executive function skills. So with that in mind, we're gonna use video. 
we're going to use video because it engages our students. And by the way, we're going to use video to show the students what they need to do. We're going to create videos. Great. I know a lot of schools that are doing it. I know a lot of schools that are doing it. Uh, uh, I was talking to a director of special education out in Denver a couple weeks ago. He brought together his children and all the cousins, and they went over to a couple buildings, an elementary building, a middle building, and that served as their secondary, their secondary building as well. And they created videos on everything from lining up to social distancing to how to get your food at the cafeteria in a safe way to uh, using the restroom, all those different things. They created videos of that. And basically, they created the videos and they put them online for the entire district. So, by the way, if you haven't thought about that, I'll reinforce that in just a moment, okay? So, all we need is video, right, Sean? And we need a model. It's all we need. And we'll be good, right? No, no, not right. And by the way, yes, that's Cindy Crawford. Yes, I'm showing my age. Uh, I think she's mother now of a couple models. I don't know the model's names, but I know Cindy Crawford. But it goes beyond just simply video of something. Instead, this goes back to evidence-based practice. So, and it also goes back to the connection to the technology. So if I'm trying to get at this issue, and I apologize for the, you're like, come on, Sean, let's, let's move here. But I'm trying to, trying to make that connection between, we've got these things we need to do face-to-face -face in preparation for our hybrid, or we have these things we need to do in preparation for that digital learning. So what are we going to do here to make certain the students understand it, they can practice it, they can visualize it, or we're going to use video modeling. Well, this is a perfect example of using evidence-based practice with the technology, and this actually is tied to the two very nicely. See, video modeling is simply not just simply taking video. It's not. Video modeling, as many of us already know, has 10 unique steps and actually has four basic overviews. So let's, let's review that real quick. So basic video modeling, we have a targeted behavior, right? And of course, with that targeted behavior, where we want to make sure it could be the social, it could be the social emotional, of course, but it could be social distancing. It could be the pandemic health issues, operational. It could be the executive function targeted skills we're trying to teach. But those are the things we're trying to reinforce that we can create to get to, uh, folks started. And of course, from a building perspective, there's a number of video models that would be very appropriate to deal with the face-to-face -face issues in this new hybrid blended uh, experience. There's class specific video models we we'll want to create. Everything from the ins and outs of Seesaw to Google Classroom to overviews of the hallway, bathroom, et cetera. So these, these are things. And then for our specific things, it might be going over our classroom practices. It might be going over our classroom expectations. These are models, folks, that I think we should be creating now. We get them up. We get them at home so they can watch them. So when they hit the ground first day of school, they have watched them. They've seen these. And of course, we can do review. We can do reminders. Of course, we can collectively watch them as well. But those are things that will potentially make things more efficient and more effective and using effective practice. Now, video self-modeling, right? Video self-modeling is that perception of the individual. For some of our students with disabilities, that's going to be critical for them to understand those rules, for them to understand what's expected of them. Point of view, of course, uh, is the fact that, I'm, I'm sorry, I was just describing point of view when I was talking about self-modeling, that point of view from their perspective. And then, of course, prompting, where we break things down, and we can do those individually and, of course, collectively as well. But these are ways that we can create some of these models, and we can empower mom and dad to help them at home, or grandma, grandpa, or aunt and uncle, to help them at home to be practicing, facilitating, so they're feeling more comfortable about their child coming face to face, the child's more comfortable in the transition, and a host of other things. Now, as I mentioned, video modeling is just not simply Cindy Crawford and some video. And so I have a couple of links here, folks, just to make you aware of them. If you're unfamiliar with the steps, here are the 10 steps on uh, implementing video modeling for individuals, particularly with autism. It's very explicit, it's very specific. Now, if you go to the prior slide, I offer another link. This simply offers some general steps as well uh, in terms of what the research says on video modeling and again, what the steps are and how to potentially do it. Now, this is a very thorough way. I'm not saying you have to follow it step by step by step, but it's something to be thinking about. Oh, and by the way, with the video modeling, to me, it also reinforces the fact that we're just not simply shooting video. We have to shoot the video and we have to edit the video. 
So now that's a targeted skill for me as an instructor to be thinking about what video, okay, I'm going to use my camera or what video means am I going to use? Am I going to use my computer? Am I going to use my iPad? What editing software am I going to use? I'd recommend iMovie if I'm on the Mac. Movie Maker is not bad for Windows. And there are a host of other Chrome uh, apps, screen, uh, Screencastify, Screenomatic, and things of that nature for our Google users, or excuse me, our Chrome users. So now it's using the video and the editing to be able to create what I need. If not videos, then we'll use our social stories. We're already there. We know that. But we need to create our social stories very explicitly as we transition in. And many of us are saying, of course, we're creating those. Well, great. But again, these are types of things I'm going to share with mom and dad in preparation for that hybrid. Why? It's going to maximize what we can do prior to them getting into the classroom. It's going to reinforce what they need to do when they're in the classroom. And hopefully it will free up more time for me to be able to get into that instruction I want to get into versus potentially spending several weeks making sure everyone's set. And next thing I know, I'm in mid to late September, and then we can actually get into instruction. And that's something, when we think back to the pandemic, we don't want to copy. And that is, when we were teaching in the pandemic, we really didn't focus in on instruction. We did more safety and social emotional. We don't have the time or luxury for that going forward. Of course, there's lots of tools out there that have done this for us. By the way, places like BrainPop, and I tend not to think of BrainPop when I think of individuals with disabilities, Although I love brain pop for individuals with disabilities, they, they tend to, brain pop tends not to think of students with disabilities. But if you're familiar with brain pop, it always starts off with Tim and Moby. And here, let's, let's get started here. What? Uh, Up in the news. It always starts off with a, a, a letter. And Moby is the, uh, the robot. Tim is the, uh, the young man. And what is it? Annie for the brain pop junior. I always forget. But they set the stage. And in this instance, they do a wonderful job not only offering the pandemic, but telling you what you need to do, washing your hands, wearing your mask, things of that nature. So there's a variety of resources that are out there for us uh, that allow us to be able to use these things uh, in preparation. So the questions for us, what are the issues that we'll need to hit right home very easily, very early, but in preparation for that hybrid to maximize if we're only two days face-to-face -face and the rest online, what are we going to maximize? Everything from uh, some basic overall learning things, classroom practices, safety practices. Uh, I, we, we identify them now. How are you going to introduce them? How are you going to structure them? Are you going to create social narratives? Are you going to create videos? And by the way, from an efficiency standpoint, tell the principal, vice principal, director of special ed, hey, these are global ones. These are things that go across all the elementary classroom. These are things that go across the entire middle school. You guys are going to create these. I'm going to focus in on these over here because I'm a physical therapist. And when they work with me very specifically, this is what they're going to need to do. Or even across our related service providers. What are the things collectively that we could jigsaw? I'll create a video here. I'll create a video here. I'll create a social narrative over here. And then we can maximize that. Very critical. But to me, the reason I spent the time, and, and I know I've spent a lot of time on this, but it's an excellent illustration in my perspective of using digital technologies, video, editing, with the practices we need to address for hybrid, safety, executive functions, general skills that we need to put up online into our hybrid blended learning management systems to be able to facilitate that learning. And by the way, these are models that mom and dad, grandma and grandpa can facilitate at home. The list goes on. All right. And of course, what video tools to consider, what editing ideas, I've already mentioned it. I won't go over here because of time, but just FYI, Josh Stock, well, you know what, I will. Josh Stock uh, is a middle school teacher, uh, English language arts, but he has a phenomenal, he actually came out with a new book called Awesome Sauce on how to use video. He has a great YouTube channel on breaking down the use of video in the classroom. Uh, it's really basic stuff as well as complex stuff, everything in between. So take a look at that in terms of using video, how to use video. All right, so let's take a sidestep here. And you're like, Sean, you've been doing a lot of sidesteps to begin with. Well, let's take a sidestep here even further. And let's think about how we want to map out some of our hybrid blended learning experiences. And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, um, we guess just simply say, uh, we're going to create our own kind of, we're going to get into this and 
and, and this is how I'm going to create what I'm going to do for hybrid, or this is what I'm going to create for blended, or, or I'm going to do this over here online. It's important, I urge you, to take a step back or take a step sideways and really consider what is already out there. Not only has the wheel been invented, but the bicycle has been invented or the car. And what I'm talking about that, folks, is the fact that some of us may be thinking that we're going to design things from a backward design approach. Or we design things from uh, this related service perspective. Or we design things from you know, this instructional framework. But I urge you, urge you, urge you, be it problem-based learning, be it differentiated instruction, however you organize things, we have to be thinking blended learning. If you have not looked at the blending learning models, I have a number of resources in that folder I mentioned earlier. I urge you to take a look at those models. And why? Because those models, they've invented the wheel. They'll tell you about what not only what flipped classroom is, but how to utilize it. They'll talk about station rotation. They'll talk about flex, the model, a variety of other ways. And the beauty of this, as this visual shares, is that, okay, maybe we're gonna start off hybrid and then go fully face-to-face. -face. Well, again, based on the things we need to do in our classroom due to COVID, we're probably not gonna have as much time as we have had in the past. That's still gonna require digital content or instruction online, be it reinforcing drill and practice at home or whatever. But of course, some of us are gonna be fully online, but we are gonna go face-to-face -face sooner or later. So how do we design for that flexibility? This is a model that's already done it for us. Now, I know this one's hard to read, but if you actually have the slide in front of you and open it up, it's easier. But the slide here, this visual representation, is there's a continuum, and there's a way of planning and designing for that continuum. And so it's not simply saying, here's a group of digital tools I'm gonna use. It's rather, no, how do I uh, use those digital tools in this model? Now, of course, your philosophy of instruction, how you plan and design your lessons, how you think and organize things for that face-to-face -face model will still be critical. But take the blended learning model and make the connections. If you're ignoring that, you literally are like those cavemen and going around with square wheels instead of those circle wheels that people have created for us. So I urge you, take a look at some of those resources if you already haven't, and start planning with that in mind. And of course, the blended learning model comes out in a lots of different functions, of course, in a lot of different ways, with a lot of different flexibility. And I can't urge this enough, folks. Blended and hybrid learning has been around for years, and it's been shown to be fairly effective. And yes, it's a great way of connecting with the home, not putting the responsibility on the home, but connecting with the home and reinforcing some of those elements. I'll get into that a little bit later in some of my sessions. Now, there's a video here. I won't take the time to listen to it. It's only a couple minutes, but I do want to emphasize the fact that one, if you go look at this, I think it was 2015 when this was shot, 2016, well prior to the pandemic, where they're saying hybrid blended learning has a lot of positives. And what are some of those positives? Well, some of those positives, first of all, is it offers reinforcement. It offers that just-in-time learning. It offers opportunities to practice. That video, she talks about the ability to rewind. And I'm so much a believer in that, in that we can post things in our learning management system that oftentimes we wanna spend more time with the student so they can make certain they understand those directions, make sure they're processing the right way, make sure they're getting access to the material besides just one option, maybe five or six or seven options. This is where the blended learning, learning management system, we can put that there for the hybrid, but also for the fully aligned, of course, but it's giving those students those options that maybe in the face-to-face, -face, it's often limiting. So this is where it could potentially be even more inclusionary, but also provide that support. It also allows for enrichment, contextualization. But the other thing for all of us, special educators that are so focused on curriculum-based and progress monitoring, it's data. The learning management systems and the content management systems provide us rich data. And I'll be talking about that in my last session on assessment. But these systems, as many of us already know, come with the fact that data will be there for us. It allows us to uh, develop trend lines. It allows us to take a look at the dashboard to see where a child is performing against themselves as well as against their peers. 
The technology we use also in a more blended hybrid experience can be more engage, uh, engaging. Uh, it can a allow, again, a level for personalization. So there's a lot of neat things that blended learning allows for. So please, please, please take a look at those models and utilize them in some of your planning for what you already do. And I think you'll find it's a great reinforcement and great support for our learners that struggle. Now, one last thing on this in, in respect to the fact that it does also allow our students to work at their own pace, their own pathways, things of that nature. Okay, and this is totally separate from special education. Hybrid blending doesn't talk about special education per se, but when we look at these options, we're like, oh, perfect or great for students with disabilities. All right, so lots of different models. So things that we need to do though, as a special educator, as that related service personnel, we need to be asking these questions, folks. We need to look at the model and the, how are we gonna organize our content? What tools are we gonna use and for what purpose? Well, Sean, I'm gonna use video. Well, for what purpose? So for example, as a speech and language pathologist, I might be use video to video to take myself or of course our colleagues to really show some of the things we do face to face. I'm also gonna use, so therefore I'm gonna have a library of things where parents and their children can watch to understand what I'm talking about when articulate, use the tongue in this way, use the, I'm not a speech and language pathologist, so my examples will be horrible. But I'm also gonna ask mom and dad to use Flipgrid or use other video uh, components to allow their child to show themselves practice speaking. Now it might be in a nice quiet bedroom, but it also could be out in the environment where there's a social distancing but they're trying to generalize some of those skills. That might be a little bit harder with the mask right now, but I'm gonna give direction to the child and to the parent and how they can videotape themselves to show their progress. So, so there's a tool, and then I'm arranging how I'm gonna use that tool. How am I gonna plan and design? And overall, what I really need to focus in on are the big ideas. So, so some homework, sorry homework folks, is it's critical to review the models. A, a blended learning, et cetera. I think you need to determine what's going to work for you. And then you need to be asking yourself, what are you going to do face-to-face? -face? What digital solutions work well? I'll give you an example. Some folks face-to-face -face will say, I've got to do assessment. Okay. And that means that extra drill, that extra practice, the extra prompting, you may not have time for. I'm going to use digital tools for prompting, for extra practice, for drilling. They're perfect for that. They're made for that. And I'm not just thinking video conferencing, by the way. Uh, online learning, hybrid learning goes much more beyond simply turning on the video camera and doing what I do face to face. All right, so those are some things we need to think about. The other thing we need to be thinking about due to our limited time is what are our key concepts we want to, to illustrate? Those are the things that we may reinforce face to face, but also we're going to have over in our digital presence. So in our learning management system, I'll just refer to Google Classroom as well. If it's very important for this key concept, I'm gonna illustrate it maybe via video. I'm gonna have a graphic organizer to facilitate that as well. When I'm face-to-face, -face, I'm gonna reinforce it. I may have some guides for parents to prompt and to reinforce as well. That together is all critical to this big idea, to this key concept. Am I gonna create that for everything? No. I'm gonna plan and design that for what's critical and using the hybrid, the face-to-face -face in that manner. So it could be essential questions, core concepts, what I think is an enduring conversation, uh, enduring understanding. And of course, we're phenomenal at this, right? We already collaborate, but this is gonna require us to that enduring understanding. So if this is critical in fourth grade, how's it connect to fifth grade? How's it gonna to connect to sixth grade? Oh no, this is a standalone fourth grade experience that we've decided to add, maybe that's not a big idea because it isn't something we build on in fifth and sixth grade. I'll leave that there, lots of different concepts. All right, so I wanna finish here and then allow David to, to jump in with an example of how I plan and design using the blended hybrid, thinking about technology, thinking about evidence-based practices, but bringing all those things together in terms of designing for that experience. And I need, I need a roadmap, I need a roadmap. I need to understand where I'm going so I can design appropriate for it. And so in my mind, I'm designing for that variability. I'm designing for my big ideas. 
I'm designing for the barriers my students are facing, be it what's going to be the limitation because they don't have me as much face to face, the hybrid, the new medium, et cetera. And with that in mind, I'm going to use a framework that many of us are familiar with, or at least we've heard about, and that's universal design for learning. And for those that haven't heard about it, simply, 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 I am planning to make certain that I give ample options to represent any material that my child is going to interact with. So if there's a reading component. It's not just going to be text. I'm going to use the digital tools like text-to-speech, annotations, highlighters, and things of that nature. I'm going to utilize those. I'm going to use video. I'm going to use images. I'm going to use audio narration to provide options to represent that new material. I'm going to provide options for the ch child to show what they know to express themselves. If I'm asking them to do some spelling words, I may do it with comic strips. I may do it with visuals. I may do some video. I may do digital storybooks. I may use audio narrative. And finally, I'm going to make sure I give lots of engagement to not only engage at lots of options, not only to engage my learners, but to build their ability to persist and to build the ability to self-monitor and scaffold. So these are things that are, I'm thinking that UDL gives me a framework for. So what UDL allows me to do is, and you've seen these pictures before, where we're trying to balance things out, we're trying to provide some equity, and we're designing some additional boxes for that young individual, or maybe not young individual, that short individual. And that's great. Good designing, good planning, a lot of extra work. But UDL, to me, allows me to say, well, wait a minute here. I need a fence to protect the child and the athletes, but that fence is going to be transparent. So my designing and planning with the tools I select, with how I go about instructing it, is going to be as maximizing my effort and make it more effective and efficient for all the learners I'm working with. So universal design for learning, for many of us that know and are familiar with the concept, and for those that are, don't, let me do some reinforcement. UDL allows me to plan across all three of these areas, and let me use engagement as my example, and then we'll leave it up to uh, David here. In the area of engagement, UDL provides me a map. I'm going to talk more about this when we talk about engagement later on. But this map initially says, hey, we need to engage the individual. We need to recruit their interests. And we're going to bike. We're going to be the educator. We're going to create all these interesting things. And the students are going to come along from the ride. They're just sitting in the back. But I need to map out and plan that somewhere along the lines, I'm going to ask the child to bike themselves. I'll give them some support. I'll give them some training wheels. But I need to, them to be a bit more persistent. I need to, them to give me some effort, especially if they're fully online. And equally important, somewhere along the lines, I need to develop skills where they're biking on themselves. They're self-regulating. They're self-monitoring. They're developing those executive function skills that allow them to be a successful, self-determined learner. So I need my pathway. I need my map. And I'm going to use self-determination for that. So today, we have lots of different uh, topics, lots of different sessions that are going to kind of make the connections as we plan for hybrid, blended, fully online, everything from speech to occupational to physical therapy to autism specific for individuals like autism. I'm going to focus in on a continuation of how we engage our learners and how we assess our learners. And of course, David setting us up for the legal framework. Uh, and we're not doing this just because it's required, but with the legal components, what is required and uh, how does that structure things? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn off my camera and let David take it from here. Um, thank, thank you, Sean. And I, I appreciate what you did. I appreciate you setting it up. Um, and just the interest of full disclosure, mine will not, I will not, you won't be able to see me. Uh, while I'm presenting as you were with Sean, because I'm not in my Zoom studio. Um, I apologize. My, my wife's a professor at Dickinson and she's teaching her class right now. So she has delegated me to my son's bedroom. So um, what I, before, I, before I begin, I just want to take, take a second and appreciate all the resources that Sean has provided for you. Truly spend some, some, some of your time looking at this. There's a, there's a wealth of resources. Even if it's not directly applicable to your situation, what it will do, it, it will allow you to start thinking and start paying attention and 
thinking about what you can do and how you need to modify. You'll hear me say this later, but you just need to think about how 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 we're going to do this um, and what we're doing as we as we watch this. So please spend serious time with the resources that uh, Sean has provided, but also there's the opportunities over the course of this next academic year for you to follow up with additional questions as we're doing as we're monitoring uh, how this is how this is playing out and what we're doing. Um, and I'll, so I'm going to share a lot of information relating to the legal aspects and pay attention to this. But before I begin, before I begin, I want to start, since he, he gave you resources, I'm going to give you some resources. And these two resources have been uploaded, from my understanding, to the Schoology website. The first one is a 504 accommodations guide. Um, many school districts um, and, well, many individuals who are writing 504 plans often don't have training in how to write a 504 plan. Um, this is a document that you can use to write a 504 plan. Um, what I did is um, I surveyed many of the school districts with whom I work with and uh, came up with a list of the prominent disabilities in which they have to deal with. There's 30 disabilities covered. Um, I've since found uh, some errors. It's not perfect. But what we did is for each one of these disabilities, we came up with a description. Then we came up with three to four valid websites for additional information and a list of 25 to 30 different uh, possible accommodations you can have for that disability. Uh, so when I say this is I want to emphasize this is a document that is being right now used in 13 states to help them uh, as passed out by their state boards of education to help them write their 504 plans. It's available for you. Please just it's free download. Please get this. Um, why it's free right now, um, because I, uh, I think in certain January, I'm writing a book on 504 accommodations, and I won't be able to pass it out at that point, so take it while you can. But it really does benefit individuals who are out there as a part of this. It's in the Schoology website, and it's something out there that you can, that you can be of assistance. Um, it doesn't cover all disabilities, but it gives you a think about what's going, it can give you some thought processes about what to pay attention to. Um, it's interesting. Um, um, I know it doesn't cover all disabilities because as an individual who has uh, food allergies, it doesn't cover food allergies. And for that, I'm very sorry. Future updates will. So keep that in mind as a part of this. But please pass this out to whomever might benefit from it. The second thing we have in the Schoology website is an article that I just, uh, I, I authored with a, a colleague that I write, um, I'm, I'm writing multiple books with, Michelle from the University of South Carolina. And this is an update on the U.S. US Supreme Court's ruling in the NDRS um, case versus Douglas County in 2017. This came out in June. And so this is an update about just how to define educational benefit. I actually do not like the title because the law changed, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this is, this is a, a keep you update about where we are as part of this. Um, and so I want to emphasize this. And I really want to emphasize what's going on as we talk about education and education for kids with disabilities and what we can do as a part of this. This is a great resource and something just to kind of remind you where we are with this. So before I, I'm going to talk broadly about the law and the and things. And, and but uh, as 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 uh, as Dr. Kirby emphasized in the introduction to me as, as a part of this, um, I just want to emphasize that some of you know me. And typically, if you know me, it's not because of you've had a positive experience. Um, I, I was a due process hearing officer for the Commonwealth for many years, and now I work with school districts that have been sued. And what I do, and, and parents, and I'm, I also I work with parents, and I also am involved in a major class action lawsuit against the state, which you will hear about, not Pennsylvania, which you will hear about on Friday. Uh, it'll be on the front page of your news, do not worry. But what's interesting about this is um, I'm working to try to reduce litigation and try to move things forward and learn from this, from learn from where we are with this. So I can't, I can't help but uh, talk about how the law has influx in, and the implications of COVID and what the law has said relating to this. I, I want to emphasize that it's important that we pay attention to this and we pay attention to what we're doing as a part of this, um, because it really does, uh, um, pay attention to where we are with this. So I want to start with just talking about the law and the in context of COVID-19. And so just to kind of give you some update about where we are. So first, um, the law stands as it is. IDEA, though not built for a pandemic, is the law of the land. And when the framers of, of, I, of, of Public Law 94, 142 and 1975 were writing this and we are, we at last reauthorized this in 2004, 
the concepts of the pandemic and what we were doing relating to this, there was no stretch of the imagination that we could ever, ever assume that this was something we were going to be discussing. So keep that in mind as we talk about this and keep this in mind as we talk about the responsibilities. We keep in mind the responsibilities and we keep in mind what we're doing as a part of this. So I want you to keep this in mind. That I understand it may sound like I am placing burdens on educators. I'm just wanting to let you know the reality of the situation. And just as further introduction about myself is that I come from a family of educators. I am proud of educators are rising up trying to help and provide assistance for families who have children with disabilities, their kids, and also to meet the needs of these kids who have these disabilities. I, when I say I come from a family of disabilities, uh, when, I was, when I was in school, my dad was my superintendent of schools, which allowed me to get away from everything, get away with anything that I needed to do. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, it's bad that I did. Um, but also, he's, my dad is now executive director of the Urban Superintendents Association of America. He talks to all the large city school district superintendents on a regular basis. Um, I, my sister's an educator. My daughter is working at a residential camp for kids with severe autism in the Poconos right now. The did not shut down, which just shocked me. Um, my son uh, is unemployed as a result of COVID. He doesn't know it, but he's going to become an educator. So, And my wife's working right now as we speak as a, as a professor at Dickinson. So uh, my main gig is I work at Shippensburg University. I'm proud to be a member of the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education as a professor. And I teach the special education law classes and provide a lot of supports for these kids. So I want to let you know that we're monitoring what we are with this. But the law has not changed. So when I talk about the burdens, I'm talking about how this is going to affect not only you, but affect family members of mine and how we need to do this. Because when we talk about kids with disabilities, one thing you're going to hear me saying this over and over again, repeatedly and redundantly, is that kids with disabilities have disabilities at no fault of their own. They do not choose to have a disability. It's not like they wake up one morning and say, I think I'm going to have autism today, or, or next week I'm going to have LD because it's easier to abbreviate. They have disabilities at no fault of their own. And what we need to do, and I'll emphasize this in a few minutes, is we need to do what we can to be compassionate and try and provide support to them. So keep that in mind. So to give you a quick update, quick update, I, uh, I, we provided you the copy of the article relating to the NDRF Supreme Court case, which is the law of the land. And I want to emphasize that as a part of this. But I also, I'm just going to give you a brief kind of update on what that case was. It's, it's just like a, a five-minute version. And I've got pictures. So it's even better. So, uh, but talk, talk about this. The NDRF Supreme Court case. Just to remind you, we needed this case. Oh my gosh, we needed this case. When I say we needed this case is just, uh, just for, for a minute, I'll give you the history. It is a public law 94142 was passed in 1975. We started implementing it in 1977. And um, we had our first, first, and first Supreme Court case was a case on defining appropriate education. It involved a child who was deaf in the Hendrick Hudson School District in, in Pittsville, New, New York whose parents felt it was their uh, the school district's obligation to maximize their education. The school district said, we only have to provide an appropriate education. And the, what, the challenge based on from there was what was meant by an appropriate education. The problem with this case, and bad cases make bad law, is that the, the girl involved in this case had an IQ tested somewhere between 130 and 142. Um, and so, and she was making passing grades in her kindergarten and first grade class. Um, I would sincerely hope that you have a kid with a 140, 142 IQ is going to make passing grades in their kindergarten and first grade class. I just, I just, I'm going out on a limb there. But when I talk about this is the Supreme Court heard that case back in 1982 and they defined appropriate as whether the child is a two-part test that they had basically has the um, is a district and state complied with the, the laws. And this is why your special ed directors have hounded you for timelines for years, as a direct result of that case. And the second, has the child received an educational benefit? And so what's interesting about this is benefit was the law of the land, and hence the title of the article that you're going to get a copy of from teaching and sexual children. That was the law of the land. So we've been living with this. And why I've been living with this is... And I'm going to go all I'm going to go all Schoolhouse Rock on you for a second. And if those of you do not know what Schoolhouse Rock is, it's a great teaching resource. I do highly recommend it. 
This is the geographic boundaries of the circuit courts that exist. These are the courts that, that exist just below the Supreme Court level. And we are in the Third Circuit, uh, which includes Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, the Ninth Circuit, which you can see out in, on the, to the left of your screen, is, is large. I think it, it's I think exceedingly large. Why is it exceedingly large? Is it's based, and that's the Ninth Circuit. It's based on census data from the prior, prior to the 1900s. Um, so um, just to just remind you that we've had this thing called westward expansion since then. I, I personally think it's bad. We're going to get over it. But this is the court system. Why is this important? Well, here's how the various court systems were interpreting the, 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 end, the rally decision from 1982. Just to remind you, we live in the fair, fair Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. There's two other Commonwealths. We live in the fair Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and we were part of a higher standard uh, for what we expected kids to receive relating to special education. And why I talk about this is this should bother you about what other states were doing. You can see the lower standard in the First Circuit up by Maine, the Second Circuit in New York, the Fourth Circuit, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, lower standard Alabama, Georgia, Florida, lower standard by Texas, lower standard in the, uh, in the, in, in the mountains, lower standard for the plain states. And well, the Ninth Circuit, that's just confused. And again, this is not drawn to scale. Now, many of you know I do work in Guam, and Guam is not south of Arizona. But I talk about this is that we live in the higher standard states. And it shouldn't matter to you where a child lives, the education that they receive. I live in Carlisle, and we get a lot of families who move here on an annual basis for the U.S. Army War College. Uh, they, get, they get my name ahead of time. We talk to them. If these families have children with disabilities, they find out if they move here, for instance, from Texas or Florida, Alabama, or even from the Pentagon, where they were working before, that their child is starting to receive a better education here. So it's not uncommon that the, the individuals who are here that they're, they, they will they will keep they, if they only come for one year typically they will leave a spouse here and who stays with the child who has a disability while the other one is posted to Afghan or uh, Iraq or the Pentagon so because the education that they're receiving here is significantly better than what they're getting in other places so when the Supreme Court looks at whether we need a case one of the things they look at is the disparate levels between the circuits and you can see how very different it is here so let me let me talk to you about the Andrew case. Andrew, okay, or we're going to go by Drew. Drew attended the Summit View Elementary School. This is, and that's my shadow in the very uh, lower um, um, part of the picture. This is taken in January in the old days when we used to be able to travel. Um, Summit View Elementary is in Douglas County, Colorado, which is the county immediately south of Denver. Uh, if you go down I-25, it's where Council Rock is. If I were to go stand over by that no outlet sign off to the left, I would see an outline of the skyline of Denver in the background. That's how close it is to, to where, where, um, where he was going to school. Um, and Drew was a kid with identified as having autism and also ADHD. And during his kindergarten, he attended the Douglas County School District at this school for kindergarten through fourth grade. And during that time, there were really no changes to his IEP. His IEP goals stayed the same. They were also not reporting on what, how much progress he was making on a regular basis to the parents. Um, so just think about this, how much easier it would be if you didn't have to do reporting requirements and also as a part of this. Um, so I talk about this is he would, and his behaviors were getting worse. Um, he had a problem with flies. If a fly came into the classroom, he would elope from the classroom. Um, he had a problem with the school bus. He, um, there's also reports that he uh, periodically would urinate just stand up and urinate in the middle of the floor of the classroom if he got frustrated. There was nothing in his IEP that addressed behavior change goals. And so the parents were upset. So they got the exact same IEP for him for fifth grade. And when they, when they got the same IEP, they then enrolled him in this school. It's called the Firefly Autism House. This was taken in August when the, when the trees were green. Um, it's in Southern Denver. And the parents sent a tuition bill back to the school district. The school district said, we're not going to pay for it. We're, 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 we're doing just fine. And so they filed for due process hearing. They used administrative law judges, and the administrative law judge sided with the parent, I uh, guess, the school district. They appealed it to the circuit court of, of Colorado, and the circuit court sided with the district on that one. They appealed it to the uh, 10th Circuit, which is the court just below the Supreme Court, and the 10th Circuit sided with the school district. And um, I'm working with a school district. I'm, I'm talking to them, and we advise a, a client, and they 
and they win at the hearing officer level of circuit court and in, the, in our area, the third circuit, I would think of it, our poop don't stink. And so they, they, they appeal this all, the, the parents appealed this to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, and I've always wanted as a hearing, when I was a hearing officer, I had multiple cases I was involved in the death in the third circuit, but none to the Supreme Court. I always, parents always uh, said, I'm gonna appeal this all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court takes 10,000 cases each, it's close to, uh, I'm sorry, reviews close to 10,000 cases and only takes between 80 and 90. And so it's a big deal when they do take a case. And here I am, they heard oral arguments. There I am before I started doing duathlons, it was, um, so I'm, I'm thinner now, but there I am off to the right. And uh, they, in order to get in line for the Supreme Court, you have, in order to get in, you had to on a first come, first serve basis. I was there um, at five, uh, um, uh, five in the morning, and and I would, and it was really interesting as a part of this. Um, they, it was cold, it was rainy, it was miserable, but I got in and I heard the oral arguments. So, um, if you ever get the chance to hear oral arguments by the, in the Supreme Court, I highly recommend that you go because it'll give you one, it'll give you faith in one third of our government. And so it, it is, it really is good. Um, so I, I do, I do recommend it. That's Mitchell to my immediate right there. I'm, I'm the one on far right, uh, which is not really where I stand. But it's interesting about this. The Supreme Court, in a rare unanimous decision, in a rare unanimous decision, held that it, to meet its substantive obligations under the IDEA, a school must offer an IEP reasonably calculated to enable a child to make a pro progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. Rare unanimous decision. It was an eight to zero decision. And what's interesting about this, it was eight to zero because they had not, uh, eight, only eight justices at the time, they had not replaced um, Antonin Scalia, who passed away in the previous year. He was replaced by Neil Gorsuch, who, um, who was from Colorado, who, uh, who had ruled as a part of the Andrew decision when the case was in Colorado, that the school district was doing just fine. So Supreme Court justices do matter. Um, so why I'm talking about this is two things, two very specific things. Is first, is the obligation of school districts is for kids to make progress. That is your obligation. If a kid is not making progress, you're not doing your job and you need to make sure you emphasize this. The second thing, and the second thing is in light of the child's current circumstances. You can see this, this is a direct line. Um, and why, and I, whether you like Chief Justice John Roberts, he's articulate and this is something that he wrote, he's the author of the decision. The child's current circumstances is we under are under a global pandemic. So when we talk about a global pandemic and the, the services that we're providing to these kids, I can't. I, I want to emphasize that we're dealing with some issues that we, uh, IDEA was not designed for, but we have to think about this as we do uh, uh, as a part of this. So what I'm going to talk about over the next part of this, and then in my session later this morning, is what I'm going to talk about is. Uh, when I, I work with a lot of school districts um, and 27 states right now in one territory, and I'm taking questions that they are having just in the past four weeks and, uh, and kind of distill their questions to help give you guidance as a part of this. Um, the guidance that was given by uh, Dr. Sean Smith earlier is wonderful. I highly recommend you spend an enormous amount of time with that information. He's, a, he's an excellent presenter. I'm sorry he went first because it makes me look bad. But I talk about this is that he gave you wonderful guidance. What I'm going to talk to you about is more implications about meeting the needs of kids on a day-to-day -day basis, legal obligations, and things like this. The advice I'm giving you should not be in place of your lawyer. So make sure you follow the advice of your of your counsel. But I'm going to talk more from an educator's perspective as a part of this, of what we need to do to provide appropriate services for kids. Because that is our obligation, right? Uh, there's a, there's a um, U.S. Department of Education um, frequently asked questions on the Andrew F. decision. Um, I did I, I did help as part of the review and rollout of this. Uh, so I was part of this. I helped do the presentation on the Andrew decision for the um, Department of Education. Um, and so I, I recommend this. I recommend you read this. Um, I'll, 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 I'll forward it, um, it to the Schoology website so you can get a copy of this. But why I'm talking about this, it emphasizes more relating to behaviors than just academics. And so when you, yes, academics are important, but you have to pay attention to making sure that kids are making progress, not only in academics, but also in behavior goals. Drew was a boy who had behavior problems. 
And we need to emphasize this as a part of this. And it's much, it's significantly easier to write academic goals and throw your kids on uh, in front of a computer and take data on what, how they're doing on this. Behavior goals are hard to measure, but they're vital. And they're important that we pay attention to where we are with this. So keep that in mind as we address this, okay? So what I'm gonna do as a part of this is I'm just gonna give basically some important considerations. Some important considerations that we need to pay attention to as a part of any decisions we talk about this. And um, I'm, a, I'm a special educator. I'm, I, I, that is my, the role I play in life. I mean, I'm a special educator, uh, it's, it's where I am. Um, I'm, I appreciate the, I also, I'm also a cyclist and I appreciate uh, Sean's uh, emphasis on biking and, and UDL on that. Um, and, and his emphasis on talking about Cindy Crawford, who I uh, got to see student teachers in her class and where she went to high school when, um, when she was valedictorian. But I talk about this. Um, is to address these issues and pay attention to these issues so that we can pay attention to and dealing with these things and pay attention to where we are as a part of this. Um, so these are important considerations. First, make sure you address the safety and health of everyone. You address the safety and health of everyone when you think about this. It's not just the students, but it's the bus drivers. It's the, it's the individuals who work in the cafeteria. It's the school secretary. It's, um, it's the classroom aides and paraprofessionals, related services personnel. We'll talk a little bit about them in a few minutes. Is we need to make sure that we address everyone's safety and health and we keep this in mind and we keep this as a part of this and we keep this as something that we keep as a focus because safety and health has got to be paramount for what you're doing. Yes, we're focusing on trying to get kids back in school and yes, we're trying to figure out how to do this, but focus on the safety and health of everyone. The second thing, is focus on compliance with the law. And we'll, I'll give you some tips later about uh, just how to basically participate in meetings, what to do with training paraprofessionals and, and how to do these kinds of things. But you need to focus on compliance with the law because the law has not changed. And I want to emphasize that the parents need supports, the parents need assistance, and the parents need help on that stuff for this. I'll talk about this in a, in a minute, but your obligation is compliance. And it's, and it may seem there's more like a crossing the T's down in the I's kind of things, but it really is a real thing that helps us understand how to help these kids move forward. Because as I said just a few minutes ago, these kids have disabilities at no fault of their own. And what we have to do is provide appropriate supports for them as a part of this. Which brings us to the next one is document. Docu I'm sorry, provide faith. We'll get to document in a second. Provide faith. And this means that we're going to have to start thinking about what is a, what is appropriate education for these individuals that we're working with. Many of us have been trained in special education, but we were not trained often in doing things virtually. And so we have to think about what are our obligations and what we need to do this. I'll address this in a few minutes, but you need to pay attention to what we can do to provide faith and make sure that kids with disabilities are receiving the appropriate education as a part of this. Number four is document. I'll give you some tips and guidance relating to providing and documenting what we're doing. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, typically, and those of you who know me, when I come to your school district, I, I come there, we do a paper, paper review of what's going on and try to determine whether uh, the school district should uh, respond, how the district should respond to the parents' due process hearing request, or when the parents contact me, what documentation they have as a part of the due process hearing request. It is basically look at the documents. And so I'll give you all sorts of assistance and, and guidance relating to this. But I, I, I mean, I was involved last year in 85 due process hearings. Uh, 79 of them, we, we, we settled very quickly because we often did not have their perfect documentation. This is all pre-COVID. So make sure that you have this and, and, and emphasize this and be part of this. But keep that in mind. The last two is, and these two go together, is that you need to be creative about what you're doing. You really do need to be creative. Um, and, 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 and keep talking about this and keep trying. And what I mean by this is keep, keep emphasizing that you continue to push these kids forward and keep trying to push this where we are with this and keep emphasizing what we can do to be of assistance for these kids. Um, but don't, but just be creative. Um, and, and think about new ways to get information. Um, the, the YouTube, there's ways of posting videos on the YouTube that kids can watch. There are ways of uh, all the different uh, sites that uh, Dr. Sean Smith showed you. There's all these different things out there. Be creative, use these. They may not be perfect for you, but be creative and use them for thinking about how to do this. But the final thing is just don't stop trying. 
don't stop trying. I'm going to say this multiple times through the course of the morning is maybe the parents don't respond to that. You have a scheduled session. Doesn't mean you should stop. Try another way. Try a different way. Or the kid doesn't seem to get it this way. Try something different. Um, just try another way. It's, it's, it's better for the kids that you don't stop trying. It's, and, it's, and I can't emphasize this enough. You need to continue to provide services. And you need to continue to do this so that we can pay attention to where we are with this. But it really is important to the parents. Okay? More unimportant considerations on just COVID specifically is that everyone's experiences are different on this. I truly, every, there is not one COVID response. There's not one COVID response. I mean, I just remember when this first started happening, right? Um, this first started happening, we, we all say, oh, we'll get through this, things like this. There are some people who are happy by being loners and staying at home. There are some kids who don't want to get on the school bus. There are some kids who don't want to be there. There are, there are some kids who just don't want this. There are others who I just can't wait to be part of the parties. They can't wait to be part of the assistance. They want to go to bars. They want to go to football games. They want to do things. So everyone's experiences are different. Just realize, just realize that there is not one response. There is not one thing. So yes, it, we're all under this global pandemic, but people are dealing with this in a very different way. So keep that in mind and people are responding, which is causing, and so the second thing, change, right? Change. It's, uh, we are all living in a very different world. Um, COVID was not a term that all of us knew at the beginning of, this, of, the, of, the, of January. COVID was not something we thought. The wearing of masks in public, that was not something that many of us discussed. Um, going online to get my groceries from the grocery store was not something that I did. And that has changed rather dramatically for me because I did a lot of impulse buying and I've lost a lot of weight because I'm not buying so much. So it's been, there's been change in my shopping, but there's change as a part of this. We've all had to deal with changes and for kids. And this is where education comes in. For kids, you as educators were a rock. You are stability. You are, you are, you are the, the thing that kids could count on on a daily basis to see and be there. Some of these kids didn't want you to be there, but you were there for them anyway. But you have to think about this, the change, and then we're moving to remote learning. It, it, was, it was hard, but at least this past spring, you, got, you knew the kids when you went to remote. You knew what to expect. This fall is going to be different, except for some of you who are looping or some of the special education teachers who continue to have these kids. You're going to have new kids and you're going to have to work on finding creative ways of, of, of establishing rapport with these kids and being part of this. The third thing is stress. And what I'm doing is I am closely monitoring schools that have started, for instance, in Georgia and Indiana that started two weeks ago and watching how they're doing this. And what I'm talking about this is the kids that, and we'll talk, and, and, and the kids were stressed. Parents were stressed. But, but I remember, I, I talked to a teacher in, in Indiana last Friday. I do a lot of work in Indiana. The teacher on Friday said, the kid brought in brownies. And she said, I, I uh, fresh homemade brownies, and I lowered my mask to eat the brownie. And I realized, I, I, for the first time in a whole week, that my face had been exposed. Um, so it was really interesting about this. But there was also, I talked to a parent of a child who I, who I do work with. And there, there was a kid, and the kids are socially distancing, that's fine. But the kid had a sneezing attack in the back of the classroom. And the, the kid was uh, worried that the, the kid, this uh, second grade girl, she's worried that she's gonna get COVID as a result of it. So it, it's a very real fear. So there's people who are stressed, but also you're gonna be dealing with families that are stressed. Families that can't make, because of business failures or business shutdowns, they can't make rent payments. They can't make housing payments, or they have a family member who's sick or individuals who've lost their jobs. The stress, the stress is, is terrible. So for many of these families, they're leading a life that they're, they're and you're gonna see this. And so we're gonna talk later about this, about the stress that some of these families are having. It really is posing a problem for them, so keep that in mind. But we all have a desire for normalcy. We all have the desire for normalcy. We all have a desire for going back. We all have a desire for wanting to have things be there so that we can do more. Back to where we were before. I'm not sure what normal is going to be like in the future. And if anyone tells you they know what normal is going to be like to you in the future, they, know, they tell you what it's going to be, they're lying because they don't know. So, but I, I talk about this as we don't know this. But we also, we are, we're unsure of when we're going to be able to do what we need to do. And why I emphasize this 
and I, I really want to pay attention to this, is we're going to be unsure of when this is going to happen. Remember when we first started this back in March and say, yeah, I can make it to Memorial Day. I can make it to Memorial Day. Well, Memorial Day came and went. We're unsure. And I'm betting, I'm betting if we all knew, if we all knew that this would end by like, for instance, December 1st, we all knew this. We could, we could, we, we could be fine. We could do this. We could do this. All right. So it, 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 it is what it is that we have to think about this is we have to pay attention to the services we're providing and the fact that um, we're unsure of this. But it's also, we're exhausted from it. We're tired of this. I mean, I am, I, I'm, I'm a, uh, by nature, a very social person. I like to talk to people. But now when I see people when I'm out running on the trails or walking my dog, I cross to the other side of the street because I don't want to get close to certain people or just people in general. So we're, we're all becoming exhausted by this. So when I, I can't emphasize is, if this is tiring or all dealing with this, but some of these families are dealing with this and we're having to address this. So keep this in mind as we talk about this. Okay. So let me just uh, 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 something try to be a little humorous. As I said, I, I depressed you. I don't mean to. I can't click my heels three times and be back in normal school. Uh, yes, I, I moved to Pennsylvania from Kansas. Um, uh, Sean's picture of, of the, that beautiful background of hey you in the background. I live right. I, you can almost see my house in that picture. Um, but yes, um, I, I, the Wizard of Oz and three and three clicks. I, I yes, it means something to me. So it really does. But you can't do this. But also. Okay. Um, parents, parents are dealing with a lot of stress as a part of this. And when I say parents are dealing with a lot of stress is the discussion that I've had just with families on my street is um, there's a high school principal on my street who I, I was talking with his wife last night about this. And she has to go back to work. He's going to be high school principal and they got two kids who need to go to school. Um, how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this if the kids don't go to school every day? How is it going to be a high school principal? How is this going to happen? So keep this in mind as we're, we're having to provide instruction for our kids at home as a part of this. Okay. So, all right. So 2020. Um, is, it, is it good? Yeah. I love Gary Larson, but man, this really summarizes it for me. Um, not a huge fan of liver or onions. So it's just basically, um, it, it, it poses significant problems, but this is, this is basically what we're living with. And this is what we're dealing with as a part of this. So these are things that we have to pay attention to. And this is something we need to address as a part of this. Okay, wait, there's more, okay? Uh, and, and, um, and what I emphasize this is that necessity is the mother of invention, is that um, that's why I go back to you guys need, as teachers and administrators, you need to keep trying to provide services for these kids. Because what you're doing is, is, is in, it may not be working, but you need to keep thinking about different ways of doing this and ways of providing supports. And for families and parents, uh, there's families um, who are, who are going to work to find a vaccine before the scientists. Um, I felt like I was, I like my kids. I really do. And now that both of my kids are in their 20s, I like them even more because they realize that I know something. But why I talk about this is I was a better parent because my kids went to school on a regular basis. And so it's not that I didn't like them being around, it's just that it made it very difficult, okay? So when we talk about this, this is what we have to think about, right? So last thing, before we get into more of the meat, the school can't control the spread of lice, the flu, the pink eye, chicken pox, how the hell they're going to control for COVID-19. Um, kids by nature, on the whole, are social individuals. Some of you I know have seen the pictures of the, the, of the hallway transfers in, in Georgia. Same thing are going in some other states right now. So keep this in mind as we talk about this. And keep this in mind as we share this. So, all right. So there's a fun one. Let's get to the more of the meat. Okay. Tip one. The first thing you need to do, and this, yes, we're going to get to more legal things, but I want, I, I can't emphasize this enough. This first is just be compassionate. Given that uh, families are leading a stressful life, one that they not, did not sign up for, one that they did they're not paying attention to, it really is posing problems for them, is just be compassionate. I guarantee you're going to get emails that you're going to find. You're, you're going to ask who wrote this email. This is not the parent I knew. So just be compassionate, realizing that parents are stressed. Parents are trying to figure out this, and many teachers are stressed because we, we we spent the summer coming up with plans of how we are going to deal with this and how we're going to respond to this. And now we we're dealing with oh we got to switch now we got a different thing now we're going to go two days now we're going to what which two days are we going to go which kids am I going to get. How are we going to get, just be compassionate with all these distresses of people. 
Second, focus on the laws. Pay attention to laws. Pay attention to the law has changed. Is your obligation for timelines? Your obligation for providing services is still there. So keep that in mind as we talk about this and keep this in mind as we address this. But focus on the laws and do this. But the last two, similar to before, is I, I want to emphasize this. I can't emphasize this enough is just be a decent person. Be the one who responds to the, to the parents in a timely fashion. Be the one who's there. Be the one who's helpful. Um, be, yeah, just, just, just be the person and realize if they send you an inflammatory email, please don't take it personally. They're just they're just leading a very stressful life, and they just want they just want to get through. They want to get through the week. They want to get through this. They and they're worried about whether their 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 rent money is going to come from, or their car payments, or their cell phone bill. They're they're worried about these things, and they're just worried about getting sick. Um, it's 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 a stressful time for a lot of them. So, but be the be decent person and helpful person in the room. Just just step up a part of this. Because I'm, I'm betting, I'm betting that each and every one of you has had a, had a negative experience with someone through either an order from Amazon or setting up your cable. I had to get higher speed cable at my house or just, just arrangements with anything in general. Be the decent person. Don't be the person who's snippy. Don't be the person who's snotty about this. Just be that person. Because why I say this is you are the representative of the school. You are the representative of the school. Uh, years ago, I wrote a book on how to market your schools. Uh, but how, the, you are the representative of the school. The, the, the parents don't know everyone else in the school district, but they know you. And you're the representative of what's going on. So make sure that you give, you respect them, you, you honor them, you, you treat them with respect, and you don't belittle them, and you don't talk down to them. So just be that decent person who does this. Second thing, child find. Child find still exists. Child find still exists. And so those of you who are in special education, be aware that um, you are the ones out there who we come to with these questions. But remind your, remind your general education staff and remind your, your principals. Right? Many of you know that I work with principals a lot. Uh, remind your principals that if you have a kid out there who is showing signs of issues, showing signs of problems, showing signs of needing more supports, is that what you, what you can do, okay? Uh, you may you need to make sure that you you continue to look for these kids. So if you have a general education teacher who, for some reason, the kid is starting to really struggle or showing signs, you got to remember that it's it's general education teachers who are the front line of defense who identify these kids for special education for us prior to the new uh, special ed. Because we we in special ed we typically don't go looking for these kids because we've got enough to go, going on. Is the, the obligation, the obligation to identify these kids still exists. It still exists. So what you need to make sure that what you're doing as a part of this is you're still making sure that others are referring these kids for testing or at least maybe just meetings, not necessarily the full shebang on the testing is vital. So make sure those of you special ed go out there and do this and keep this in mind. All right. So the second thing about child fine, the second thing about child fine, is this is for those of you going back to school? This is how school sites are going to be doing their classroom observations this fall. They're going to be crawling around in the ceilings of your schools, and you'll hear like you'll hear them. They're, they're, they'll, they'll, they'll work to being quiet, but they'll work to be observing as they part of a social distance as a part of this. So when we do this, it may be also in the spring too. But as they do this, work to be provide the supports for them and be part of this and be part of what needs to be done to be assistance to them. Make sure that what we're doing is we're helping them. The other thing is if you, and if you could do this, this is what I recommend, is school psychs are worth their weight in gold. They truly are. Um, I, I luckily get to work with a variety of school psychs. Um, I have some good friends who are school psychs. Um, they, uh, they, too, shut down in March, April, and May. They too shut down and they were unable to finish a lot of triennial and biennial evaluations. And then they were not, they couldn't finish some of their initial evaluations at the time. Um, they, um, many of those kids in, in early intervention, they were unable to do these evaluations. Um, so when we come back to face-to-face -to -face and when we actually can do this, they're going to be incredibly overworked. So what I recommend is right now, uh, you have a good friend who's a school psych, send them flowers, send them candy, send them something because their job is going to be hard because they're going to be so overworked. Um, 
maybe offer to wash their car or cut their grass or just walk their dog or something like that. Free babysitting also works. But it's just basically they're going to be overworked when they come back to school or face to face because they not have access to food. So I, I can't I can't recommend this enough is that you need to treat your school sites with respect because they provide a valuable resource for your school district and we need to do this. Okay. So wait, there's more on child fine. Child fine is what we talk about this, right? It is if an eligibility team, of which many of you will get the opportunity to serve on eligibility teams, find the sufficient data are not available to make a valid determination about SLD or any other eligibility, then you should be documented in a plan put in place for obtaining the needed information and what you need to do, need to, do to complete the eligibility process. What we need to think about as a part of this is we need to make sure is that we're continually not just saying we don't have enough data. You need to figure out and try another way of getting the data. Just continue to try and access what's going on as a part of this. You need to think about where we are with this, and you need to pay attention to this as a part of the process. And we can't, I can't emphasize this enough. The child find responsibility for your district does not end when COVID hits. It's still there. The law is still there. This law is still there. Keep that in mind. So wait, more on cultural considerations. Cultural considerations, and I, can't, I want to emphasize this, is uh, there's been, as you understand, right? Disproportionate rate. There's a disproportionate rate of occurrence of some students from various ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and they rely a lot on this, right? So there are new students who are increasingly uh, in, engaged in whose homes are in poverty, and you're going to see more students. I, I guarantee you're going to find more students who are going uh, to uh, be involved in poverty situations. Uh, or have single, and just the increased risk of disabilities associated with this, or the increased risk of disabilities in environments that lack resources and supports for single parents, or learned behaviors that you're going to see, or you're going to see, or just kids you can't access. I mean, there there are kids, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes. Um, uh, it just it is it is it is really good uh, as we talk about this. Is we need to think about this. Is make sure that you are paying attention to what's going on because there are some families with whom you are working with who when we do surveys they think you have a computer that the kid can use and they'll say yes right one of the parents or both the parents need to use it for work the kid has siblings the kid has siblings that they need to that needs it at the same time or the parents are accessing all of your class through their cell phone um, and the cell phone is the only way that they can do this because they don't have wi-fi at home and the cell phone has data plan packs, or the cell phone is not as smart as the parents want to want their cell phone to believe. So you have to think about this. Is keep that in mind as we talk about this. Is cultural considerations. We, we often over identify these kids, but keep that in mind. Just keep this in mind as we talk about this. And so keep that as, as part of this. More on this, okay? Uh, so documentation in my session later. Um, I'm going to talk more about uh, specific specific tips for how to document what's going on. I've got 20 tips on how to actually document things like this. But what you need to think is make sure, just to just wet, wet your appetite for this, is teachers and case managers should document all efforts to communicate with parents and seek parental input concerning services. Um, as a parent of a child with a disability, I, I appreciate how school districts would reach out to me and pay attention to what's going on. So I, I appreciate this. Um, but it, it's it's important, and it, and and parenting for a child who has who has uh, who has needs does not end. It does not end when they reach a certain age. It does not end just in the witness or uh, interest of full disclosure. It does not end when they graduate from high school. It does not end when they graduate from college. Um, so it's it's something that we have to pay attention to as a part of this. Is that um, you have to think about this? Is it's a document what you do and document how you're paying attention to this and document your needs relating to this, but document how you reach out this. Um, it, it really does affect what we're doing as a part, a part of this. And we have to, um, what we have to do is pay attention to it um, and, and address, I like this. So keep that in mind. So keep that in mind as we talk about this, but document where we are with this, just document. So I'll have tips on this one. The next one is uh, COVID-19 and medical issues. A plan should be developed to provide for the safety and health of students upon the return to school, okay? And too often, we're not thinking about special the needs of individuals with eligible for special education as a part of this. 
or even some kids who are on 504 plans. Um, there are some kids out there who have medical needs who are receive, we're receiving 504 plans. So please reference that 504 document. And um, I'll give you my email just in a few minutes. Some of you have asked for this as a part of this. I'll be happy to send it to you so that you can use it. Um, but when I talk about this, is, is you can have some kids who maybe had diabetes or um, asthma who may not have been receiving special education related services previously, but may need assistance from us to make sure that what we're doing is providing appropriate supports for them. But you also have to think about the kids who've been exposed to this and provide for safety and health of the students upon their return to school. There is some discussion in the long-term effects of COVID. I'm, I'm watching this very specifically, some, um, as some athletes who have been diagnosed with, with COVID and how it's affecting their, their, their ability to use their lungs afterwards. Um, I'm watching very closely. I've got a good friend whose uh, brother is on the University of Michigan swim team. And they were, uh, many members there were, were diagnosed of the swim team were, were diagnosed with this. And uh, just how does this affect their lung capacity? So it's something that we're gonna have to think is, is COVID gonna be considered a pre-existing condition or a separate condition of itself? Because there are often also are individuals who are having issues relating to uh, had COVID who are having memory deficits as a result of this. And so there, um, so we're having, we're having issues relating to COVID that you need to pay attention to as a part of this. And so, but you should develop this, but think about all the needs of kids. But also, I mean, just think about some of these kids and I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there. Like my, my brother-in-law, has, is identified as having profound intellectual disabilities. Um, he is not, uh, from what I understand, not worn a mask. He's not willing to wear a mask for longer than 30 seconds. So there are some kids out there who are not wearing masks. And there's some individuals who are not wearing masks. And won't, so their ability to take in the public and participate in what's going on, we need to think about this. Next, keep team members for development of the plan should include school nursing staff and school health directors. Keep them involved in the process and pay attention to where they are. But also, Make provisions in the plan for students who do test positive and be, can be quarantined afterwards, okay? And their need for being quarantined before returning to school and also for the needs of health issues who cannot safely attend school, as I alluded to just a few minutes ago. Because you're going to have some kids who cannot safely come back to school. And you need to pay, you pay attention to this and pay attention to what's going on there. Think very broadly and think very specifically about what's going on. Too often we don't think about this. You may have bus drivers with breathing problems. You may have cafeteria workers with breathing problems. So not only think about the needs of the individuals with whom that might be in your classes, but also think broadly about the staff and the staffing needs that need to be addressed as a part of this. So keep this as we pay attention to this. I cannot emphasize this enough that you need to pay attention to this. But as a part of this, as a part of COVID-19 and medical issues, okay, some things that you can reasonably expect. And I'm very specific about this. Reasonably expect. First, you're going to, yeah, you can reasonably expect more requests than usual for homebound instruction. I, I, I truly expect this, right? Truly expect this. Um, there are parents and I, and I don't blame them at all for doing this. Parents who are going to one of those, for lack of a better term, dock in the box places. They're going there and they're getting prescriptions to say kid needs to be educated at home. Kid needs to stay at home and kid needs to receive services at home. So you're going to expect this, right? So get, get expect this. And um, one of the issues we're seeing as, as I'm working with school districts right now is issues often not just from uh, what we often think of as like a, a physical medical condition, but also issues relating to anxiety. Anxiety for getting on the bus, anxiety for just going through the school day, a variety of anxiety issues. So keep that in mind as we talk about this. Expect more requests than usual. But second, students may need to stay home due to a medical condition. You're going to see this. You're going to see it as a part of this. Medical conditions and, and, and pay attention to this. So keep this in mind as we address these needs and we pay attention to this as a part of this. So the one thing that you should sign up for, and you should, guys all should volunteer for this, um, and, um, and all teachers should volunteer and, and sign up for this and make sure you probably hopefully get paid for this, but like you be, be a homebound teacher who can address the possible increased need. Some of you have done homebound instruction previously. Some of you participated in this process prior to this. So you have to think about homebound instruction and what we can do as a part of this and where we are as, as, as to address where we're going with this. And what I want, I can't emphasize enough to this is that you're going to have, you're going to have teachers, you're going to have the need for teachers to do this, but it's a way to keep track of where we are with these kids. 
Homebound does not necessarily mean that you go into the kids' homes, as many of you have done homebound previously, but you have kids who are homebound. And that homebound should not be viewed as a permanent placement for these kids. We'll talk about that in my later session about what we can do to facilitate moving these kids back to school and steps for this and related services that we can do as a part of this. But what we need to think about this is that you're going to expect more requests for this. This should be something, right? Uh, but one, the last thing before I, I take a break is evaluations. Evaluations, all right? Um, many evaluations, as I alluded to before, when I was uh, honoring, um, and as you should, uh, and I really do want to make sure that we emphasize honor the, the school sites out there, is that they've been delayed because students, lack of access to the students to administer the testing. Your obligation to administer the testing, your obligation to provide these testing does not end. So what I want you to think about this, truly, think about these as steps, is uh, work as a team. Develop a list of students whose evaluations have been delayed and prioritize those for evaluations once the students are available. Start just working as a team to prioritize who needs this assistance, prioritize where we're going to go with this, and prioritize what's going on, um, and just pay attention to this. Um, and so... Um, so keep this in, in um, and I see I, I, the awfully worded sentence in the next one, but pay attention to this as we're going through this and figure out who are the ones we need to do evaluation. And when we talk about this is because you're going to have some kids who, uh, who may have been receiving special education services prior to COVID in March, who may have, what we talked about in the, using the, the, the jargon of the, of the Commonwealth, itinerant level services because of problems they may need to be bumped up to supplemental. And you need to think about, is this something that we need to strongly consider for them? Second thing, you're going to have increased kids who are because of anxiety issues or experiencing trauma. Um, and and um, some of you have had, had, had me come into your, your districts and talk about just basically trauma-informed IEPs. And we're going to, we're going to have some sessions on this uh, later on today related to trauma and later on this year related to trauma. So there are some things you seriously need to learn relating to implementation of IEPs for kids who have experienced trauma. But focus on the kids' needs, maybe not the eligibility over trying, maybe focus on, this poorly worded, focus on eligibility over necessarily some of the triennial evaluations and, bi and biennial evaluations as, a, as the only state nation that does biennial. So we keep this in mind is focus on the needs of these kids and see what we can do to help provide the services and help what we're doing with this. But then also, as I alluded to just a minute ago. Focus on students who may have extensively regressed over the break. There are some students out there who really have regressed, and there are some issues, and we need to think about what we, as a part of this. Um, think about where they were at the end of, when we went end of face-to-face, -face, and this will help plan instruction as we go on this. So keep this in mind as a part of evaluations, okay? So last thing, I'm just gonna put up my, uh, my email address uh, so that you can see it. All right. I am a proud professor at SHIP. For those of you who have gone or worked at SHIP, I, um, I'm a proud, uh, we, proud to be part of this Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education. That's my email address there. But I also have a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed, a Sped Law blog, um, and where we post about every once or twice a day. Not, it's not overwhelming. It's all, so, so if you're interested in special education legal or policy issues, it's a way to, um, to pay attention to the issues, and both of these are free. Uh, um, the only thing we often uh, do push and try to advertise is when I, whenever I have a new book out, I, I put, put it out there. There's no obligation for you to buy anything. It's free updates. So if you, if you know of individuals who, who use the Twitter or the Facebook and they want free updates on special education legal policy issues, that's where we go with this. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm gonna turn it back over to the PAN folks so that they can talk to you about how we're gonna transition. Um, um, this will also be posted in the Schoology website later, but I'll, so I'm gonna turn it over to them as, as we speak right now, so, all right? Thank you, Dr. Bateman, and thank you, Dr. Smith, for starting our day off with so many resources and, and, and lots of great tips for getting the school year started. At this point, we are about to transition to the, uh, the concurrent session sec uh, segment of our day. Uh, the agenda for the entire day is available as a hyperlink uh, in, the, in the description for this, uh, this YouTube stream. As Dr. Kirby mentioned prior to Dr. Smith, uh, the concurrent sessions all have several different uh, options to pick from, but space is limited in each one. 
if you encounter a message that the Zoom room is full, uh, please select another great offering to attend live. But then maybe later today or this week, you can check back into the Schoology course and access all of the recordings and resources for the other sessions you did not attend. Also, noting that the concurrent sessions are, are quite literally back to back to back, there is not a designated lunch break in today's agenda. For Act 48 credit, participants are asked to select two out of the three concurrent sessions before attending the keynote at the end of the day. So uh, as you're taking a look over the agenda and prioritizing which sessions you would like to attend, don't forget to give yourself a break. You can choose which concurrent session to kind of skip to allow yourself that lunch break today. As mentioned, at the end of the concurrent sessions, uh, concurrent session number three ends around 2.45, we will transition back into uh, this Zoom or this YouTube live stream for our closing keynote remarks from Carol Clancy, the Bureau of Special Education uh, Director. So at this point, we encourage you to stretch your legs, grab another cup of coffee if you need it, uh, maybe send Dr. Smith and Dr. Bateman a friendly message on Twitter, and then we'll see you in the Zoom rooms for concurrent session number one, starting at 11. Have a wonderful day.